Thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I've stood in this church many times, um, and surprisingly, you might not believe this, but I've actually used sports sometimes um, in the context of my homilies. Um, and actually, when Dr. Sexton's talk was announced the other day, I said, uh, baseball is the road to God. At Villanova, basketball is the road to God. <laughs> And over the last uh, several months, I felt like basketball consumed my entire life. So it is, uh, it's a pleasure to stand here in front of all of you and welcome you to this talk tonight. As I said, I, I've talked about sports several times in this church, and, and one Sunday I actually used the uh, baptismal fount as an example of um, the Super Bowl on Super Bowl Sunday. Um, and I said to everybody, this is the real Super Bowl, and they all laughed. And then there was another Sunday I used um, the enthusiasm of people over a team called the Eagles. And I said I'm, I was, a, I was a, a little embarrassed that you weren't as enthusiastic over my uh, presence and homily that you are at the Eagles. And after Mass was over, I was berated by an Eagles fan for um, condemning the Eagles. And I said I wasn't really condemning them at all, but I was just using that as an, a an analogy. Uh, Dr. Sexton is well known in the area of higher education. Um, to us who are presidents in this field, um, he is a mentor, an individual who has led New York University to great heights and continues to really blend together what it means to be a president of a university. And I was uh, rather taken when reading his biography about the amount of time he spends actually teaching and his involvement with students. And he actually teaches two classes a semester and leading NYU. And I felt a little ashamed that um, I didn't do the same. So I'm, I'm going to work towards that. Uh, but he is an, an individual who has always kind of blended the academic world and his own scholarship and research, as well as his teaching, into uh, leading an institution that um, I have a great deal of admiration for, more for the sense of the Tisch School of Arts. Um, which is one of the best known acting schools in the world, um, who, and he happens to be the president of that. So I'm a little envious of that in one way or another. But as we join together at Villanova University tonight uh, to welcome him to hear um, a, about a topic that is passionate uh, for him and uh, something that he teaches um, on a regular basis to students at NYU, and we join together with him tonight to welcome him to Villanova University to share with us his thoughts on baseball as the road to God. Dr. Sexton. Thank you very much, Father. It's a great, great privilege for me to be here. It's wonderful to be in a place that feels, uh, feels so wonderfully familiar. Uh, I'm a product of uh, Jesuit education, not Augustinian education, and, and, and real, real Jesuit education. When I, when I mean by that, you know, when, when I hear people talk about being products of Jesuit education that didn't go to a Jesuit high school, I, 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 my first re, re, reaction is they, 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 they'd never understand James Joyce. <laughs> but but I, I, I have a Jesuit education for high school, for college, for my PhD in religion, and then later in life went to law school. People at NYU think of me as an academic lawyer, but they don't know about the earlier part of my life. It wasn't until I was in my 30s that I got to law school. And it was a tremendous treat for me today to, to visit at your law school, which is a terrific law school. So thank you for having me, and thank you, Father, for hosting me. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's, it's wonderful, uh, truly, to be here. So several people during the day, I've been here uh, for, for, for several hours and uh, been involved in several events, and several, several people during the day have said to me, so we saw you on Colbert. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I have to start by telling you uh, about the background for, for this. You, you saw me on Colbert. Now, when you say, see, we lawyers, we're experts in language. We think about language. And part of what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is language. But part of what I'm going to talk to you about is the incapacity of language. So, so there's going to be a bit of an irony to the theme 
that I speak about, because if you, if you want the large picture, now right here there's only one person in the room who understands where I am, and that's this young man, Peter. Now, later you'll meet Peter. His name is on the cover of the book. Peter was my student uh, 11 years ago in the course that I teach in the spring at NYU from which this comes. And he, he said to me after my talk at the law school today, he said, uh, you know, uh, it, it takes a while for people to get used to epicycles. Uh, mo mo modern humanity thinks generally in terms of lines. Uh, uh, more ancient societies speak in terms of cycles. Advanced ancient societies speak in terms of epicycles. And the, 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 the notion of epicycle is deep, uh, for example, in the patterns of religion, the liturgical year. Uh, but, but, but we use complex, om almost uh, helix-like epicycles. And you're going to find that, uh, as I talk to you tonight, I will, I will go off on some cycle. But it will always come back. <laughs> it will always come back. And part of, part of the game is to try to figure out, you know, where, where is this going? When will it turn? When will it come back? And that's very much like life. So Peter being the only person understanding how uh, your remark that you had seen me on Colbert now leads me into a conversation about language and uh, what words mean and what words can capture. Now here, I'm going to come sharply into text and give you the headline, the punchline. And if there is one punchline ultimately that came out of the process that began 12 years ago, as I began to prepare the first version of this course, which has gone through several, several levels of existence and purpose, the headline would be this. We are in the home of a great university here. Universities are wonderful, uh, nurturing places for knowledge, the known. And at the same time, they search for new knowledge. So there is the known. And, and, and we who live in this modern society of ours, we're blessed with the known, uh, being a vast known, far greater. You know, we've moved, even if we think about the way we think about God, there, 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 there is the, the biblical, you know, heaven above, earth in the middle, and hell below, the th kind of three level, Dante's three levels of the rose. Uh, so there is that. And then at a certain point, we came to understand that the world was, was different from that simple three-decker universe. And we began to think about God out there. And, 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 and then we went farther and farther out there. And the skeptics would say, where is God? And then some, at least, in some religions, began to talk about God in here. So Paul Tillich speaks about the depth of our being. And we go through these different levels of, 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 of understanding and meaning as we come to know more, as the known expands. And it is huge today. There was a time I did my doctoral dissertation on, 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 on a man named Charles Eliot, who was only by coincidence for 40 years the president of Harvard. He really created the modern Harvard. He was the president of Harvard from 1869 to 1909 and, and really made the Harvard that is the kind of quintessential Harvard that, that we know today. I wasn't interested in him as a university president. I was interested in him as a Unitarian. I, I, my doctorate, uh, my specialty really, is in American religion. I was fascinated by the Unitarians and their claim that they had a dogmaless religion. So I used, uh, since they have no theologians or formal, formal uh, clerics, I used Charles Eliot. Did he succeed in creating in his life for his family a dogmaless religion? Uh, so Eliot, uh, you know, brought us the tremendous research university that, that has, has expanded the known. And we live in that wonderful world. But then there is the knowable that is beyond the known. The knowable. And, and my colleague uh, 
Thomas Nagel, who is, you know, one of the great philosophers in the world, he's uh, had won the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in philosophy, as has, I'm proud to say, that my NYU colleague, recently deceased, Ronald Dworkin. Sadly, a Red Sox fan. <laughs> but kind enough, nonetheless, to read this book when it was in draft for me, to protect me against at least fundamental error. But anyway, Tom Nagel's uh, new book, The Mind and the Cosmos, which is vilified by some for the simple fact that it says we don't know today all the ways to know. That we will know 50 years from now, 100 years from now, 200 years from now, in ways that we can't imagine. So there is the known, which we know today, and there is the knowable, which we may not come to know for a thousand years. And we may come to know in completely different ways. And that far, Tom Nagel and I go together. Now here, Tom, a good friend who would describe himself as an atheist, might part company with me. I'm not saying he will part company with me, might part company with me. Because the gist of this book, the gist of the course that has grown up over the years is that there is the known and there is the knowable, but then there is another important category which is the unknowable, at least in our cognitive terms. That which can't be put into words. And now I'm back to, here it comes, I'm, now I'm back to the fact we lawyers are, are, we're the word people, as I said over at the law school. We're the word people. We, we, we can say to you, I, I, I used the example at the law school today, the, the, uh, two weeks ago I taught the great play, Take Me Out, which is a baseball play about perspective. Uh, it's, 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 it's about a, uh, uh, the best player in baseball making an announcement that he's gay and all that flows from that in terms of the team and the perspectives of people and the way they look at him now and the way he looks at himself and everything else in the world that it concatenates around that announcement. And I spent a little time with the class saying, okay, just take the title, take me out. Remember the, remember the book? Elephants eat, shoot, and leaves. An elephant eats, shoots, and leaves. That's what it was. And how it was different when you put the commas in, right? Uh, from when you didn't put the commas in. The, the, the former being three acts, eating, shooting, and leaving. The latter, without the commas, being dietary. An elephant eats, shoots, and leaves. So this is what we lawyers do, right? This is called constitutional interpretation. Back in my previous life, when I would study scriptures, it was called exegesis, <laughs> right? So, so this is what we do. We're the word people. And words are wonderful. And I stand here to say to you, words are wonderful. And I stand here to say to you, science and knowledge are wonderful. And there is the known and the knowable. There is that which we have put in words and that which we can put in words, but then there is this third category, the ineffable. The unknowable in our cognitive senses, the unknowable in, 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 in the words we use. And there comes to the foreground this wonderful word, myth. Not the way Americans use myth as falsehood, but mythos, mythos. There comes, here we go, Father, Poetry, theater, song, you've got it all, big fella, you've got it all. <laughs> so when it comes to it, when it comes to it, you know, I, I, I was blessed in my life, I have been blessed in my life by being loved by the most remarkable human being I ever met. She didn't convince me of that with a syllogism. I have experienced that love. And for me, and there are different, you know, Peter said, my God, the Schwartz family would never believe I'm about to speak in a church. <laughs> okay? His Jewish mother is, at this moment, probably feeling vibration she doesn't understand. <laughs> to her, it's ineffable, okay? Uh, but uh, she didn't convince me 
that she loved me with a syllogism, but I, I knew that and know that more certainly than I know the law of gravity. And uh, the fact that the liturgy speaks to me in my church, I'm a Catholic, the fact that the risen Christ is meaningful in my life, the fact that, that I know that life has meaning beyond the obvious, I know that Lisa still lives, even though she passed from this physical, physical place six years ago. These are things that I know, but I can't know in cognitive terms. And, uh, you know, they come into the domain of faith. They come into the domain of faith. More on that later. So that's the big headline. This book is, is, is a signal to those of us who live in modernity, where taking a drink of water has become like taking a sip from a fire hose, where everything happens in, in, in italics and bold and capital letters and, and, and you know, did hyperstimulation. It, 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 and where we have the wonderful world of science, but we're in danger, I think, of, of falling victim to scientism and thinking science has all the answers. And if we're not careful, if we're not careful, I was a group, with a group of students yesterday at NYU talking about technology, and, and, and they, 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 the, the, the danger that we will become nothing but it, and we will lose our humanity. And this is why the humanities are important, and this is why the arts are important. Because we don't want to turn science into scientism. We have to keep our appreciation for the ineffable so we know how to use the science and the knowledge we get. Back to Colbert. So it was because of this that I began to teach this course. It is something of an insight. And now I'm going to be, to see how this is tethered, the word person with you. So you said you've seen me on Colbert. Mm -hmm. And I would say to you, what does that mean? Here. My, well. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you that couldn't hear, I want, could you please stand up? <laughs> Well, what, what, is, what is your name? Mary Catherine. Oh, Mary Catherine. Come on. <laughs> There's got to be an O in front of the back of the name. O'Reilly. Oh, is it really? Oh, okay. There you go. Mary Catherine O'Reilly. <laughs> now, my, my daughter's okay. best friend, so you have to watch out, you see. This is an example. It, it, it is Caitlin Mary Rose Donovan, who's Jewish. <laughs> so never assume anything about Mary Catherine O'Reilly. <laughs> But now you said I was cool. That's very nice of you. And I'm going to tell my children you said that. Okay. <laughs> they, they, they will find that hard to believe. But how many times have you seen me on Colbert? Once. Once. And it was most recently when I was on yes. about the book. You said I'm a Catholic, and he said I'm the Catholic. That yes. <laughs> now sit down. <laughs> so, so, so Mary Catherine O'Reilly, John O. Sexton, and it was O. Sexton, I want you to know, uh, John O'Sexton has actually been on Colbert twice. And you should go to my website and watch both times. Because so many people have asked me about this, I thought that I would open with this story. So we're now back to the main text and the opening here. So Lisa loved Stephen Colbert and John Stewart. A and she would watch the eight shows. For those of you that don't know, you should come to know. This. this is something you can come to know and you should come to know. These are two very talented people. And in this time of TiVo, even if you go to sleep early, you can TiVo them and get them. And Lisa would TiVo the eight shows Monday through Thursday on comedy, uh, the Comedy Channel during the week. And then on the weekend, when I would come home, I, not normally viewed as cool, I would watch with her the two or three she thought was best. So I was uncharacteristically aware, kind of in the cool end of the spectrum, about Colbert. When in November 2006, a handwritten letter came into my office. And it said, Dear President Sexton, 
I understand you teach a course called Baseball as a Road to God. I know nothing about baseball, but I'm a personal friend of God's. <laughs> and, 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 and he says, you should appear on my show. So I went, you know, I, around the corner with this letter, just reading it two or three times. I'm kind of in a corner of my office, and I know that no self-respecting university president goes on the Colbert show. <laughs> you, you, know, this, you, just, you just go on, you're humiliated, you're skewered. This guy is faster than any gun in the West. You know? <laughs> on the other hand, you know, as Calvin Trillin wrote about his Alice in his eulogy to her, you know, life for me was about trying to impress Lisa. So I took this letter home, and she looked at it and she said, honey, you've got to go on the show. The students will not care if you are humiliated. All they will care about is that they can say to the friends, my president was on the Colbert show. So I went on. Now, I want you to know something, ladies. I'm going to be immodest here for a minute. First of all, I was, you're looking right here, not only at a historic figure in baseball, and I am a historic figure in baseball, OK? I am the Jackie Robinson of the B'nai B'rith Little League. <laughs> I, 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 I was the first, I was the first goy. That's what Jewish people call people like me, for those of you that don't know. We are goyim, okay? I was the first goy to play in, in, in the B'nai B'rith Little League. Uh, and and I, I was not very particularly good, but that, that first year I was on the All-Star team, because I guess they thought, we got a goy, we got to put him on the All-Star team. <laughs> But so, 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 you know, I, I'm, but I'm also the 1959 National High School Debate Champion. I'm pretty good at this debate stuff and speaking stuff, and I am extremely good at repartee. So, you know, this is what Colbert does. But, you know, I'm not, I'm not some backwoodser on this either. So I'm going to go on. You've got to make a decision you go on this show. You, you, are, are you going to just, you know, go kind of natural? And, and you know, you do no harm, you not humiliate yourself. Well, you're gonna go for, you know, and you know, Eugene O'Neill says, let those who stop at mere success and do not push on to glorious failure be condemned as the spiritual middle classers. You know, so and this is this is I've been taught by a great teacher named Charlie, I'll talk about in a moment, and I've always been one to kind of go for it. So, so Lisa prepares me for this first appearance. This is December of 2006. And, and she, she says to me, okay, now listen, he's got this thing he calls the dead to me list. You know, these are people he really hates. See, he's playing, for those of you who've never seen the show, he plays, it's uh, Bill O'Reilly. And he's in that character's mo motif. So, so, so uh, he, he, uh, she says, watch out, because he's going to come at you, because on this list he's got two things men with beards, and New York intellectuals. <laughs> and, he, and she said, watch out. And to this day, I have a picture of the three of us that we took in the green room that night with this little yellow post-it that she wrote in her wonderful little handwriting, dead to me list, men with beards, and, and New York intellectuals. So we're there. And I'm not going to go into the details of that appearance. But I want you to, this is like four-dimensional chess. <laughs> because it's, it's, it, it, it's an eight-minute spot, an eight-minute spot, live television. Well, it's not live. They tape it uh, at, at, at 7 o'clock and show it at 11.30 at night. But it's, 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 it's what they call live to tape. So it's live to tape. They said they're not going to edit it if you make a mistake. And, and you know it's eight minutes. And, and usually in a debate, if you and I are debating, I, the first thing I as a debater have to know is the strongest possible argument you're going to make. And I can anticipate that. If you make a weaker argument, that only makes my job easier. Okay, so that, but, but with Colbert playing this O'Reilly character in caricature, he can either make the strongest possible argument or he can be absurd and come in with a complete non sequitur. And so, so the first dimension is a normal debate. The second dimension of the chess game is what absurdities can he come up with? What's he going to hit me with that's, 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 that's completely out of the blue? Now, you got to remember, at this point, I hadn't written the book. I'm just teaching the course. Turns out, by the way, never touched. It was a bait and switch. Never talked about baseball as a road to God. Never talked about it, okay? 
uh, and, and then the third dimension of it is you got to remember it's performance art and that you know it's his show and, and although you're going to try to go at it with him you got to play with the rules you can't step on his lines you got to wait for the audience to stop and 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 you got to play along and then the final dimension is a mental clock of eight minutes because like in a wrestling match you want to be on top at the end <laughs> and everybody including lisa including him says if you go back and look you can go on the presidential website the first time i got him <laughs> i got him right so but he never talked about baseball as a road to god so then there is and this is a publisher's nightmare okay i i I'd been teaching this course since he took it first, 11 years ago. And he and his classmates tried me. They worked, it was a spring course, and we, they, they worked with me all summer. They said, can we continue the class? And we went through the summer. Mm -hmm. We met every week during the summer just to continue the class, continue finding new books to read, keep talking. So, and they started pushing me in this idea of doing the book. And they wanted, we had a big fight, they wanted it to be much more autobiographical than I wanted it to be. I didn't see a purpose of an autobiographical book. And then Doris Kern Goodwin and Tom Oliphant began to come about five years ago. And the three of them started ganging up on me. So about two and a half years ago, I said, okay, we're gonna do this. And about a year and a half ago, the New York Times found out about the course, not about the book. And they sent a reporter down and they do a front page article in the New York Times about the course. And they mentioned in the course, I'm writing the book. The publisher calls me up and says, this is a nightmare. it would be great if this came out when the book was out. But a year and a half ahead of the book, for God's sake, you get a front page article in the New York Times, we dream of that. But that was how I got this invitation, so it all worked out okay. Because <laughs> the invitation wasn't based on the book, it was based, you read the article. So, so, so who knew? Here I am, and there's a book. So now Colbert calls me up about the time the new year about the time you called a year and a half ago he says you're doing this book when the book is done i want you on the show i go to the show this is like a month ago right. and uh first of all he says you're a veteran we like you we're going to do something we don't usually do we're going to put you in the previous bit and they do one of these things with the rose ceremony which was a pretty clever thing and then we get on and i'm ready for this four-dimensional chess game and he had said to me in the green room he said to me, you're up one to nothing. It's going to be 1-1 one, one by the end of He's trash talking me. <laughs> it's going to be 1-1 one, one by the end of tonight, he says. He's trying to punk me out. It was like, I remember when I used to debate Jerry Falwell. It was the same kind of stuff, you know, just all psychodrama. So, 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 so I'm wondering, what does this guy mean? You know, what's he got in his, I'm trying to think if I got everything down. And we start going. And my eight-minute clock starts going. And I was doing really well. Now, I'm going to give you an example. You're right. At one point early on, I said, I'm a Catholic. Now, remember, this is before Pope, Pope Francis has been chosen. Yeah. This is about a month ago. So he says, I say, I'm a Catholic. He says, I am the Catholic. He goes like this, I am the Catholic. Now, that's all you saw. Son of a gun cut out some of my best repartee. <laughs> Of course, my next line was, going onto dangerous territory here, but go, go. high wire act. My next line was, that Stephen, and I lean close like this, we're at the table, I say, that Stephen is precisely why I've nominated you for the vacancy. <laughs> <laughs> and the crowd laughs like that, right? I gotta wait, or he's gotta wait rather. Comes out, he says, I'll never get it, I got a problem with women. <laughs> Crowd laughs much better than you people did. I wait for them to calm down, and I say my line of the night. None of this made it in. I said, they don't. <laughs> We're going on, and I've prepared for a sprint and we're in a marathon. He goes 30 minutes with me. 30 minutes. He finishes, he says to me, 
this time I get to edit. <laughs> and that thing he ended with, which was so brilliant, where he says, I get it, I get it. Baseball is a road to God. I know what God is. You're on a date. First you want to get the first base, then second base, <laughs> then third place. You get home. All you want to think about is baseball. And that's the way he ended the show. And as we walked out, he said, one, one, rubber match to follow. <laughs> OK. Double line. I want you to cast your mind's eye back, those of you that can. For others, it'll be history. For some, it'll be some felt reality. But I'll describe it to you through my eyes. Masia Eliad tells us that there is sacred time and profane time. There is sacred space. There is profane space. There is the moment where the profane, the bread and wine, become the sacred. There is the moment as, as a member of the oldest civilization in the history of the world, the civilization that goes back in continuous line for 100,000 years, the native Australians, when they approach Uluru as it rises from the outback, and they see it as axis mundi, that which connects this plane and the plane of the transcendent, that moment is sacred for them. I approach it. First of all, probably calling it Ayers Rock, because I come from the West. And for me, it's a beautiful monolith in the middle of a vast desert. And just as Peter sees the bread and wine after consecration as ordinary, I see it as ordinary. There is the sacred and the profane. There is the sacred and the profane. October 4th, 1955, one of the most sacred days in the history of humanity. For those of you that don't understand, from 1941 to 1955, New York City was the center of baseball. There were certain moments where Philadelphia got involved. I know about Robin Roberts and Kurt Simmons. I know about Richie Ashburn. I, yes, OK, I, I nod in that direction, OK? But, but the center of gravity of baseball was principally the Dodgers and the Yankees, but also sometimes the Giants, painfully the Giants in 1951. So uh, my best friend Dougie and I were the only two Dodger fans in our neighborhood. And for those of you that are young, if you've seen the movie Grease, the, 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 the black leather jacket guys, we called them the Rocks, they were Yankee fans. And, and they were bigger and older than us, because they had been left back. <laughs> and, I think, I, I, think I, I think Louis Bojano, we were in the eighth grade, was 19 or something like that. But, but they would get us in the playground they would get us in the playground. Dougie, they'd get Dougie and me up against that chain fence in the playground as the Yankees in 1952 would be playing the Dodgers and, or 53, the same matchup, 55, the same matchup, you know, and we're, we're 10, 11, 12 years old. And they would say, OK, they'd get us like this, you know. Admit it, admit it, admit it. Berry's better than Campanella. Rizzuta's better than Reese. And, 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 we were like the Christian martyrs. <laughs> and, and, and they would pummel us, you know. They would pummel us. And, and now, now, I want you to see, OK, just to check. You see this on this otherwise perfect set of teeth, a little chip on this tooth right here, you see? <laughs> OK, so, 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 so it's October the 4th, 1955. Now, in these days, the nuns in the convents did not have televisions or radios. And, and and so so and baseball was played during the day. And and the nuns would look for excuses to let us listen to something on the radio. But we had the eighth grade at St. Francis de Sales High School in Rockaway had had done some terrible deed. 
and, and Sister St. James would not let us listen to the World Series on the radio. And we're in agony because we come back from lunch, the game is starting. It's game seven. The Dodgers have never won the World Series. It's game seven, the deciding game of the World Series. Don Newcomb is pitching for the Dodgers, our best pitcher, a stud, having his best season and a phenomenal World <laughs> Series. And, 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 and we're hopeful as we go into class at one o'clock. The game is beginning. We come out at three o'clock with these big transistor radios and we turn on the transistor radio. It's the seventh inning and the Dodgers are winning two to nothing. Dougie and I run as fast as we can to my house. It's the closer of the two. We go down into the basement. We turn on the radio. It's now the ninth inning. The Dodgers are still up two to nothing. A, 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 a pitcher, uh, I'm sorry, I said Nuka before, Johnny Padres, Johnny Padres, a young pitcher, is pitching for the Dodgers. Newcomb was the pitcher that was pitching in 1951, and my mind glitched there for a minute. But in any case, Padres is pitching for the Dodgers, and, and, and it's, it's two to nothing. The Dodgers are still up. And we, we take from the wall in my room a metal crucifix <laughs> about this big, and we do what two Brooklyn Irish Catholic kids would do under these circumstances. We knelt down next to the radio, listening to the radio for that ninth inning, praying for the Dodgers with this crucifix in dynamic tension between the two of us, you know? And we're trying to milk everything we can out of this. And, and finally, two out. And now, a ground ball to Pee Wee Reese. He picks it up. He throws it to Gil Hodges, who scoops it out of the dirt. The Dodgers have won the World Series, and Dougie goes, hooray! And the head of Christ knocks off. <laughs> now that moment, that moment of deep bonding was ineffable. It was not capable of being captured in words. It was like Lisa's love and the liturgy and the risen Christ that I experience and know. And there are moments and moments that play out like this. And the course kind of developed. It developed, I, I tell the story. It developed actually the, the year before Peter took the class. A young man came up to me at an NYU event and he said, I understand you're a big baseball fan. He said, uh, it's boring. It's monotonous. It's slow. Now, I had this wonderful teacher. I'm not going to go into speaking about him here, but just I have to put a nod in the direction of Charlie. Those of you who were at the law school earlier today, I described Charlie. Charlie is the source of of my professional life. He taught me the most noble thing that one could do on earth was be a teacher. And most importantly, he taught me to think strange. He taught the teaching power of oxymoron, the wonder of trying to figure out the sound of one hand clapping. This was what, this was Charlie's life. And, and when this young man said this to me, Charlie had a phrase. I actually, I very, for some reason, Charlie just possessed me in the moment. I even kind of lowered my voice in the colloquy with this student to, to, uh, to, 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 to speak like him. And he had this phrase he would use if he thought what you were saying was stupid. He would never call you stupid. But he would say, you are among the unwashed. <laughs> So I say to the student, you are among the unwashed, my God. If you will allow me to give you 12 books to read, and you will write a paper on each of those books for directed research under me, by the time you're finished, you will understand baseball is a road to God. And that was when that phrase came out. Now notice, when Padre introduced me, he showed a bit of the clerical mentality. He talked about baseball being the road to God. I'm not a religious triumphalist. <laughs> I have my faith, but Lisa was Jewish and she sits in a higher place in heaven than I will ever sit. 
and I have a Hindu goddaughter, and I embrace my Islamic students when I teach them in Abu Dhabi. So the claim here is baseball is a road to God, a road to God, and, and the, the, the indefinite article is important to me. It's an important conceptual point. And I said, you will find out baseball is a road to God, and he did. And then the next year, there were dozens of students lined up to do this directed research, of which one was Peter, and that was when we convened the course, and the course has evolved over the years. Now, I, I don't want to keep you too long, so I thought what I would do just in the remaining time is, uh, is give you two vignettes, and then because he's so special and it will mean much to his mother, I'm going to ask Peter, who's never had the chance to do this kind of thing, uh, just to read you the last two paragraphs of the book. So you get it all kind of summed up. But let me just give you two vignettes to give you a sense of, uh, of the way we do this. So the, 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 the way the course evolved, the first insight was simply to play with the students. So objective number one of the course is let's think strange. Let's play Charlie. So, uh, you know, taking on this question, is baseball a road to God? I, I was completely indifferent to how the students answered the question. And to give you a sense of the curriculum, it's changed over the years, it's evolved over the years, but about, I'd say about 25% of the readings are stuff I used to teach when I was a professor of religion on the theory of religion, but very much on the phenomena of the religious experience. So Eliad, Otto, James, Heschel, people like that. So what is the essence of the religious experience? As experienced. Not dogma, not structure hierarchy, but the experience itself. So about 25% of the course is that. And about, I'd say, 60% of the course consists of novels. Great novels that use baseball as their motif. And where you can ask the question, for any of the characters in these novels, or in the case of Take Me Out to Play, is baseball a religion? And you have to write a paper on it. So each week the students read at least one book, sometimes two, sometimes they'll read something on theory of religion, and they'll read a novel, and then they have to write a paper. And the question they answer each week is a kind of iterative question. The material you've seen so far, all the novels, all the reading so far, as it develops through the semester, is, is uh, baseball operating as a religion for, 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 for folks or not? completely indifferent to the, it was just trying to get them to play. Then I realized there was a second thing that was happening in the course, that by kind of stripping the conversation of re, about religion of its dogmatic or, or structural elements, the students, or at least many of them, were coming to see the, 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 the religion as a possibility they didn't see before. And that was a nice thing if it happened. I, I was not proselytizing for it. And I should tell you, by the way, that the student, the student body over the years has, has been, it's a class I limit to 20. They, 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 they have to read two books and write an essay to try to get in. So they have to read uh, Marcia Eliade's book, Sacred and Profane, and William Kinsella's novel, The Iowa Baseball Confederacy, and write a 10-page paper. And based upon my assessment of the paper, I picked the 20 students. So I had to do that in the semester before they start. And then they go, so it's a very demanding class for them. They get low grades, I'm a low grader, I'm pr proud of that, and it also keeps demand down. And they still keep coming. So uh, then the, so, so the last 15% of the course, the last two weeks, is about baseball in New York from 1941 to 1958. And that's when Doris comes and Tom comes and Pete Hamill comes, and we get a bunch of people for whom this is like a period of their life they talk about. You get those people talking, and it's, it's like listening to poetry. And, and the, the students that come are, I'd say, half and half men and women. A third of them know nothing about baseball. Uh, probably 40% of them describe themselves as atheists or agnostics. I had one student, the mo most uh, unusual student, a student from Korea who had never been out of Korea until she got on a plane to come for her freshman year at NYU. And she said, I'm, I'm Buddhist, uh, but I'm told that the two things that Americans care most about 
are baseball and religion. And I think I can learn about Americans this way. <laughs> and I'll tell you, and, and this is the first semester. This semester, I actually have a, a, a student who's a, a freshman who uh, I rarely let freshmen in. I don't let freshmen in or seniors. It was a second semester course, I don't want seniors. Uh, <laughs> so, so you got to plan to take it earlier. Uh, but this is the first time I, uh, that, that I've had a Major League Baseball player. So I got a young man who was a number one draft choice of the Phillies about five or six years ago. His name is A.C. Cardenas, C-A-R-D-E-N-A-S. Went through the system, the Section 40 system and so forth. Ended up playing 28 games last year for the Chicago Cubs, mostly as a pinch hitter. And he, Gave it up, said, you know, I now have seen what these guys can do. I'm good, but not that good. Better get to college. I'm 23 years old. And he came to, came to NYU for college. So he's a freshman. It's the first time that we've had a major league ball player in the class. And he brings a different perspective. Uh, so then uh, what I'd say 3.0 version of the course, I, I began to notice that Teaching the students to observe baseball because of the unique features of baseball, its timelessness. You know, that surface boredom, beneath that is the fact that a 1-0 count is different from a 2-1 count. It's different with runners on base. It's different early or late in the game. It's different depending on when it is in the season. It's different depending on what the pennant race is. The whole kaleidoscope of things that are going on and if you begin to become an active fan instead of a passive fan, what you begin to develop is this thing that's missing in modernity, which is the contemplative skill, the skill to see the significant in the small. And, and, if you, and, and, and as the students begin to learn that, and there are some beautiful passages. Uh, this last week, what we did, for example, was the, the first 90 pages of, of DeLillo's book, Underworld, where he's tracing the, 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 that, that Bobby Thompson home run ball. And you know, it's such meticulous. It's, I mean, you read those pages, and they're so rich with detail. Or, 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 or you read Greenberg's book, The Celebrant. Notice the title, The Celebrant, about Christy Mathewson and the young man that created the first World Series ring, who had created a ring to honor Mathewson's no-hitter. You know, based on you know, real events, but then the novel, it's so interesting to hear, you know, the description of the way, you know, don't follow the ball, follow the players. See the pitcher going there. See that, watch the runners. And, and you know, all of a sudden, the noticing skill becomes heightened. And then that becomes a skill the students find useful, whether they decide then to use it, although the, 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 the amazing thing is how many of them testify it changes the way they are in the world and the way they set aside certain times for contemplation. Now, we do this. It was a bait and switch when Doris and Tom and Peter got me to do it. Because they said to me, you've been teaching the course at this point for seven, eight years. This was three years ago, remember? And they said, you got it. You just write the course. Well, you can't. You can't say to your readers, go read Eliade, go read Kinsella, do a paper, come in, we'll talk about it. So that was when, we, when I, I, I created a whole reconceptualization of the course. So there are, of course, nine innings. There's a pregame show, a postgame show, and a seventh inning stretch. So there are 12 units. And, and the units are things where you look, you, you, you see a title like Sacred Space and Sacred Time, or Faith, or Doubt, or, or Conversion, Saints and Sinners, Blessings and Curses. And you find out, wow, you can play, you can play all this together. You know, so we start the chapter on certain saints and sinners talking about the red-hatted cardinals. But it turns out when you get to the end of the first paragraph, it's the red-hatted cardinals convening to sanctify the first saint, Saint Ulrich. And then we go from that into what's a saint and do you, do, how do you judge a saint? In the context of baseball, does Ty Cobb, who was a vile human being and a racist, yet a saint, one of the first five to get into the Sanctum Sanctorum, the Hall of Fame? So I'm just going to give you a little taste because uh, of the presence of this special being here. Now, this is a person, I'm going to deny it. 
I'm going to deny it if you ever quote me as saying this. What's that? But I do love this man. <laughs> Peter. <laughs> hey, stand up just a second. I'm not going to make you talk. I promise you until the end I wouldn't make you talk. So, so for those of you that do read the book, this is Tippy. Now, and you, can, you can do a simple part. No, I'm, can I just, sit now? No, no. What? So tell him who you are. My name is Tippy, and I'm featured in the book as someone <clears throat> who told you on false information and caused a huge ruckus, to say the least. <laughs> so, so, so Tippy. This is not a man who likes to be told uh, false information. <laughs> so, so, so why are you here today? I don't know. No, but <laughs> I'm your driver. Let's explain that to them. That's I'm actually I'm being paid to drive him, but I do like him anyway. So, so Tippy. I've been his driver for 15 years. Okay, so sit down. So this is Tippy. I can sit now, right? You can sit. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Tippy works for a car service that my family started using, and the university uses, and he's divulged to us later on. He used to, you know, he liked Lisa. He liked the kids, he tolerated me. So he would look to see if our code came up and he would come in again and again and again. And he's been there for most of the important events in our life. And uh, he is a great baseball fan. He is a walking baseball encyclopedia. And he could tell you things that, you know, you could just ask him questions. I've, I've been at a ball game, somebody comes up with a question, I call Tippy, And Tippy gives you the answer. And over the years, I developed tremendous confidence in Tippy. But there's a reason, as he said, he is featured in the chapter on doubt. So I'm just going to give you a feel for the book by telling you the story of the chapter doubt, and then I'll give Peter to read. So this is the way, this is what we do in the book. Uh, you take a concept like doubt, and, and we've just finished the chapter on faith. And, and, the, and the first thing we make, because remember, we're doing religion, we're doing, trying to introduce the students to concepts in religion at the same time as we're trying to play with baseball as the vehicle. And, and there is no faith without doubt. If there were no doubt, we're told again and again and again, faith would be meaningless. So of course there, there, there is doubt. And, 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 and what already, if the students begin to grasp that, haven't they grasped an important intellectual maxim? I don't care about religion. That certitude is a dangerous thing. Beware of those who have truth with a capital T, who think that the known is the forever known as we think it is known today. Okay? Heaven above, earth in the middle, hell below. Little doubt is part of our faith. And, and, and the greatest have had doubt. He who became man had doubt on the cross, for God's sake. So let's not condemn doubting Thomas. So here's the story. We're driving along. He gives me great stuff. I love trivia. You know, and in the book, for example, at a certain point, not the chapter on doubt, I, I give the baseball equivalent of the clockmaker argument for the existence of God. So we all know the clockmaker argument for the existence of God, right? You know, you, you, what, what are the odds that if you threw the elements of a watch on the ground that they would make a watch of themselves? You know, there must be an intelligence. You know, look at this. Here we are. Isn't this a miracle? There must be some intelligence behind it. And that's the clockmaker argument. Now, you know, you get into the law of large numbers, and people would, uh, the mathematicians would tell you, we don't see the 9 billion examples that blew up. You know, we're looking at it retrospectively and all of that. So what's the baseball equivalent of that? When, when Barry Bonds, right? I always mix up Barry and Bobby. See, he's my fact guy. I specialize in truth. He specializes in facts. <laughs> These are not necessarily the same thing. But in any case, we try to coalesce the two as best we can. So, so when Barry Bonds won the MVP back to back, two years in a row, now he later won it three more times, 
But in the early 90s, it was, when he won it back-to-back, he was the 10th player in the history of baseball to win the MVP back-to-back. The first nine players to win the MVP back-to-back, if you looked at the position they were playing on opening day of the seasons they won it, you'd have the nine positions in baseball covered. In other words, there was one pitcher, one catcher, one first baseman, one second baseman, one... See, this is as a, a, a logically, structurally the same as the clockmaker argument. Okay, so it, 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 you know, it, it teaches something to notice that. Okay, it teaches something to notice that. So now we get to the chapter on doubt. Here, this man is my oracle. And, you know, I'm not a fat guy. The reason you have a wonderful student who now works for Bloomberg News and is a big shot and cares about facts is <laughs> so you make sure that you don't say that when the ball goes through Billy Buckner's legs in that famous game against the Mets, the Mets are ahead, when in fact the game was tied. <laughs> By the way, this is a mistake we made in the book, because he didn't get the facts right. <laughs> And I'm getting pummeled by Met fans all around the world. Yeah. Because they think I was ignorant. I wasn't ignorant. I didn't care. <laughs> but okay. So I had come to believe in my oracle. And he had given me a couple of unbelievable, unbelievable trivia points that were great to entertain guests at a ball game. So the first one was only once, and by the way, whenever you can start a trivia question with only once, it's a, it right away, only once in the history of baseball did anyone hit an inside the park grand slam home run. Only once in the history of baseball did somebody hit an inside the park grand slam home run. So Tippy tells me this. And it turns out, I'm a Yankee fan, I have season tickets for the Yankees. It turns out it was Mel Stottlemyre, he tells me, in 1967, his rookie year, and it makes sense. The monuments, the pit board teams, because you have pitchers up, they, they, makes sense, perfect sense. And it's a great thing to say, because you can give a hint for uh, up until 2005, the guy's in the ballpark today, because he was the pitching coach for the Yanks. And I entertain, we have our graduation at Yankee Stadium. I closed one of my graduation speeches at Yankee Stadium, giving this as a gift, you know, to, as a gift to the students, this piece of knowledge about what had happened in Yankee Stadium. Well, something that it was unique in the history of baseball, only once in the history of baseball. Second piece of trivia he gives me. Only once in the history of baseball, now you gotta wait to hear the whole thing, don't get ahead of me, did a player get up and hit a home run in his first at bat. Many have done that. And a triple in his second at bat. Home run, first at bat, triple second at bat. And this was a great question to ask New York fans of my age, because then you could give a set of hints, you know, as they struggle. The question's pure and simple. Home run, triple in second at bat. And then you'd say, okay, the person was in the majors for 20 years and never hit another home run or another triple. Hey, is this delicious? <laughs> then you say, the same year the person, the same year the person did that, they pitched a no-hitter. So now they know it's a pitcher. And then you say the person's in the Hall of Fame, and then you play, he play, say he played for one of the New York teams, and then you say, and if this is the one that gives it away to most people that are New York fans of my age, he's in the Hall of Fame as a relief pitcher, and if they don't get it then, they say his best pitch was a knuckleball. You get it? Okay. Hoyt Wilhelm, right. Hoyt Wilhelm, very good. So, there you go. Two great trivia questions. And I regale hundreds of, you know, assemblages in Yankee Stadium with these questions. <laughs> And of course, here I am in a great university. Here I am, a scholar, a university president. I'm about to confess a terrible sin. 
Are you prepared to give absolution? Thank you. I don't give Tippy as the source for this. I claim it as my own. Oh. I plagiarize. Right? So I am putting my reputation at stake as I puff myself up. Over and over I do this. Now, Fred Wilpon is a friend. He owns the Mets. And he is tormented by the fact that I'm a Yankee fan. I was a Dodger fan. You have to read the chapter on conversion to understand this. I'm not going to go into it. <laughs> on my academic gown, I have a little circle with the number 42 in honor of Jackie Robinson. I was one of the two dozen people at Rachel Robinson's 90th birthday party. She's an NYU graduate, PhD in nursing. I adore her. We're good friends. Fred has the Jackie Robinson rotunda at Citi Field. He built it meticulously. His best friend is Sandy Koufax, whom I adore. He's tormented by the fact that I'm a Yankee fan. Every now and then, maybe three, four times a year, he'll call me and say, can you come to a game Monday night? Just the two of us. I'm going to be entertaining people in the box over the weekend. I want to be with a fan and a friend and just be able to relax and watch the game on Monday night. And I usually go. He calls me. This is season before last, right? He calls me. And he says, listen, it's a Monday night, but it's not going to just be the two of us. I've got another Yankee fan coming. You're not going to believe he's a Yankee fan. You're not going to believe how much this guy knows about baseball. You're going to love each other. You got to come. I said, I can't. I got this professor coming in. I promised her I'd have dinner with her. He says, bring her. So I bring Katie Fleming, who's the deputy provost of NYU now. And there is that other fan, and it's Henry Kissinger. <laughs> and I have forgotten the fact that, uh, that Katie Fleming is a, a European historian, and Kissinger's a European historian. And this is a Met game. You know, and this is a Met game like in June. So the game is inherently uninteresting. <laughs> And, 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 and these two, these two were talking about the Congress of Vienna and Metternich, you know. And, and Red, Fred and I are rolling eyes. It's now about the fourth inning of this agonizing night. And I figure, I got to break this up. I'm going to roll out the Stottlemyre question. And I'm, I break it and I say, Dr. Kissinger, I'm going to restore your faith in the research university. I'm told you're a great fan. I'm going to tell you something you don't know that happened only once in the history of baseball. Only once in the history of baseball. <laughs> he said it's impossible with all these games that something happened only once. I said, Dr. Kissinger, I'm going to tell you. I give him the style of my question. He and Fred, who's a real baseball fan, struggle with it. Katie makes a few passes at it. I give them the answer. Style of my Kissinger is just, he says, this is amazing. I wouldn't have believed that something would have happened only once in a... I said, well, then listen to this. I got another. <laughs> and I hit him with the Wilhelm question. It's now the eighth inning. The Mets are behind. They pinch hit with the bases loaded. They send up a journeyman infielder by the name of Fernando Tatis. He hits a grand slam home run. The Mets win the game. We're leaving the box. I call Tippy. Tippy's waiting in the parking lot to drive me back to Manhattan. Tippy says, I've been listening to the game, and he gives me a piece of information. Another Tippy Gnostic secret. <laughs> I'm coming down in the elevator with Kissinger and Will Pond, the second floor, the owner's suite is one day, the second floor. About 15 people get in, and people are silent in an elevator. And Kissinger breaks the silence. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in the presence of a great man. Now, at first, everybody thought he was talking about himself. <laughs> but he says, he says, I have here Dr. John Sexton, the president of NYU, who has taught me tonight two things that have happened only once in the history of baseball. The elevator door opens up, everybody's getting out. I say, ladies and gentlemen, before you leave, 
I want to thank Dr. Kissinger for his compliment. I am now going to give a third piece of information, which has happened only once in the history of baseball. I said only once in the history of baseball has a player hit two grand slam home runs in the same inning. Two Grand Slam home runs in the same inning, not the same game, the same inning. And there, and Kissinger is like, you know, I, I, he, 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 was, he was shaking, you know? And, and, and I said, and that man, ladies and gentlemen, was none other than Fernando Tatis, the man who won tonight's game. Three years ago, when he was playing for Pittsburgh, Cardinals and the Dodgers. He was on the Cardinals. He was on the Cardinals. At the Cardinals. Cardinals in a game, Peter tells me, against the Dodgers. These are the facts that you've got to fill in. Okay. <laughs> I get in the car. We drive into Manhattan. We go to sleep peacefully that night. Right. Two weeks later, I'm at a listless Yankee game with my friend uh, Jay Furman and his son Jesse, who at the time had just graduated from Yale Law School. He objects to the fact that I call him in the book in this chapter, pugnacious. Most of the time I call him the word that we use for him usually, which is snotty. <laughs> you know, it's a relatively listless Yankee game. I break out the Stottlemyre question. Jesse looks at me and says, that can't be true. I said, Jesse Furman. The guy's a federal judge now, by the way. I said, Jesse Furman. I am the president of NYU. I am the president of a research university, a knowledge creation machine. I am saying to you, this is true. Who the hell are you to say to me, this is not true? He has one of these damn things. He says, wait a minute. It says here, Roberto Clemente in 1967 hit a walk-off inside the park Grand Slam home run. In other words, bingo, that was the end of the game. Stottlemyers was some early inning thing. I said, this is the problem with technology. <laughs> I said, this is wrong. This is error. Now, I want you to begin to notice how similar this is to the Popes and Galileo. OK? Follow the structure of the story. OK? So this is wrong. This is not what I know to be known. It is wrong. You must be in error. An inning later, the son of a gun has a list of 49 people. <laughs> who have hit inside the park Grand Slam home runs since 1900. And, and what, 11 of them in the last 20 years? I, I mean, think about this. So I get in the car after the game. In fact, I think I called you from the seats. And I said, Tippy, what's Tippy's first reaction? You want me to quote you, or do you want to say it? Yeah, you say it, because your, your, your first reaction. I told them that I meant it was he, uh, Stoudemire was the only pitcher. Yeah, but with that, that turned out, he tried a defense, turned out that wasn't true either. Plenty of pitchers have done it. <laughs> and no, but, but your first reaction was, if that Snot nose, I won't say. Strong word than that, John. Yeah, snot nose. So, so, so. I don't use snot nose. Okay, so go on. What did you say? I said, if that scumbag had kept his. Yeah, don't, <laughs> don't just say bleep. Say bleep. If that bleep <laughs> had kept his mouth shut, no one in, no one would have ever doubted us. For, for... He says he says we could have all gone to our graves happy in our ignorance. I mean, does this sound familiar? Then he falls to the next argument. He says, how many people have we told about this? And they've all accepted it as true. No one's ever denied it. There must have been people who've been at some of those games. I mean, he, he recapitulates 
the papal Galileo arguments. <laughs> Just absolutely perfectly, every logical point along the spectrum. So then, finally, I say to him, Tippy, if we accept that the Stottlemyre question is not as we thought, how do I know that what you told me about Wilhelm is true? <laughs> and he says to me, every other thing I've told you, sound familiar? Every other thing I've told you, you can count on. <laughs> it's absolutely true. And a week later, my son finds out, yes, Stottlemyre hit a home run in his first at bat. Wilhelm. Uh, Wilhelm, I'm sorry, Wilhelm hit a home run in his first at bat. He didn't hit the triple till a year later. <laughs> so we end the chapter by saying, there's a danger to this certitude thing. Now, I also end by saying, I got a problem here. Because my reputation's one thing. But you know Kissinger's going around the world. <laughs> And, and he's not telling anybody he heard it from me. He's plagiarizing from me. And you know, what am I, you know? I'm, I'm a schnook from Brooklyn. But with him, world peace depends on his credibility. So I gotta decide, am I gonna call Kissinger? I haven't. But the book is out. The book is out. Okay, now Peter has just reminded me, final thing, this only take another minute. You got it? Okay. By the way, we end the chapter by saying, there is, however, one thing of which you can be sure. And that is that the only person in the history of baseball to hit two grand slams in the same inning is Fernando Tatis. And I said, you don't even have to look it up but maybe you should. <laughs> so the book is now out, and two weekends ago, I'm down in Colonial Williamsburg with my son and my three granddaughters, and the little girls have to go to the restroom, and their dad is waiting outside, and I'm catching up on the email from the office, and an email comes in, and it's titled, Baseball is a Road to God, and it's from Joy, and I, I don't have a, a ready Joy uh, I have a lot of joy in my life, but I don't have a person named Joy. And she writes, Dear Dr. Sexton, I eagerly awaited the publication of Baseball as a Road to God. My expectations were crushed in reading the chapter on doubt with the first question from Tippy. I personally witnessed an Inside the Park Grand Slam home run and it was not by Mel Stottlemyre. Upon Googling, the list is extremely long. I did not limit the search to pitches since you did not. Since statistics play a prominent role in your book, I will not put much faith in its validity, and I have thrown it out. <laughs> so I wrote back, Joy, I do not doubt, get the pun, <laughs> I do not doubt that if you read the rest of the chapter, you will see Tippy's error is precisely the point. I hope that you will retrieve and enjoy the book, which of course cannot be understood until it is read. <laughs> she writes back, I take it as a, les a lesson learned to complete a chapter before you criticize it. Thanks for your quick response. So there you go. With that, Peter's, Peter's gonna read the last two paragraphs of the book and we'll close. Thank you very much for your attention. This book, in the end, is simply a vehicle to tell some stories that reveal a love of baseball, and in some stories, display the joy of a spiritual life. 
And maybe it shows that it is possible, even for a committed intellectual, to embrace both. It is, to repeat Tillich's words, to convince some readers of the hidden power of faith within themselves and of the infinite significance of that to which faith is related. Baseball can re reveal something about the world that our ways of living in it goes beyond what we see excuse me, baseball can reveal something about the world and our ways of living in it that goes beyond what we see on the field. It can teach us to notice and embrace the ineffable beyond, to find the sacred amidst the profane. Just ask yourself, do you, as you read these stories, see or recognize elements you associate with religion and the spiritual life? Do you see things here that resonate with you in some dimension of your being which might add value to your life? Do you see a way of looking at the world that might be useful? If so, baseball perhaps is a guide to viewing religion and the spiritual life differently, to living differently, to being in the world in a different way and seeing more in it. Okay, baseball for most of us anyway is not the road to God. Indeed, it's not even a road to God. But if given sensitive attention, it can awaken us to a dimension of life often missing in our contemporary world of hard facts and hard science. We can learn through baseball to experience life more deeply. By embracing the ineffable joys of the green fields of the mind, we can en enlarge our capacity to embrace the ineffable more generally. Baseball can teach us that living simultaneously the life of faith and the life of the mind is possible even fun. And each winter, as we long for the possibilities of spring with its awakening, and as we ponder the depths of mystical moments past in baseball and in life, we proclaim our creed. Wait till next year. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.